Well, hello, this is the Green Corn Rebellion Show. I'm Gregory Harden II, and today I am here with Brendan Finn, who is the former producer for The Majority Report. How are you doing today? Whoa, 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 stop what you're doing. Okay, if you like this video, and you like the other content on my channel, please hit the like button on this video. Also, go hit subscribe, like right now. And also, when you hit subscribe, click the bell so you can get notifications whenever I put out a new video. So, thanks. All right. Enjoy the rest of the video. I'm doing well, Greg. It's great to be here on the Green Corn Rebellion show. Yeah. And I wanted to congratulate you on your, your upcoming campaign launch that's happening this weekend. Well, thank you. Um, that means a lot. Um, and thank you for coming on. It also means a lot that you're on my show. Um, after watching you, or more or less hearing you <laughs> on the right. Majority Report for the last four years or so, it was like 2017 when you started. Because that was like when I started watching the show too. It was I started watching in August of 2017. So yeah. oh, nice. Yeah, I joined in. The end of September 2017 is when I joined. Jamie and I joined around the same time. Uh, and yeah, it was, a long, <laughs> it was a crazy four years there. And uh, I'm still working with the team in a consulting capacity um, while I'm in grad school, which has been very nice of Sam to offer me that opportunity. And uh, so if you, if listeners to the Green Corn Rebellion have guest suggestions, I'm still running that part of the show so um it's been it's been a nice little uh thing on the side and pressure release from studies all the time and keeps me engaged with uh what's going on in the discourse okay that's cool um yeah um let's see here all right so first question i have is where are you from and where did you grow up um, well, I'm from the Northeast. I'm from the New York City area. I was born in New York City. And then I lived in Yonkers for a little while when I was before I could remember anything. And uh, then I grew up in New Jersey in uh, the suburbs of New York, like, you know, ride a train into the city 15 miles from New York City, which seems like a lot closer in the rest of the country to your proximity to a city, it might as well be within a city in other parts of the country, but um, it was definitely removed from the city. It would take like 30, 40 minutes to get into the city. But um, I grew up in a town called uh, Ridgewood in Bergen County, which is the most Northern County in New Jersey, um, right by Rockland County, New York. And uh, I'm trying to think context, it's kind of like it's kind of like the Sopranos country, but it's not exactly the Sopranos country. People, I'm saying this mostly for people from the area. I'm making that distinction for them. Um, but uh, the band Real Estate, um, the famous indie rock band of the past decade is from Ridgewood. So there's that. Um, that's kind of our claim to fame, I would say, at this at this point in time. And Harlan Coben, the, uh, the uh, sort of like true crime novelist is also from there okay so that's that's where i'm from that's cool so you grew up in new jersey which is like the how do i say this uh, i heard this one analogy someone said that um new jersey is like the oklahoma to new york that oklahoma is to texas i think is what someone said to me because um <laughs> in New Jersey, you guys have legal gambling and some form of legal weed. I don't know if it's medicinal or recreational, but something like that. Mm -hmm. And in New York, I don't know if this is still true, but I assume it is. They have no legal weed and no gambling, and gambling isn't legal. And in Texas, it's the same. No legal weed, no gambling, but in Oklahoma, we have gambling and medicinal marijuana so yes i think those are, i think those are fair similarities to draw and, and I think both, the, the circumstances of each one is 
uh, the context is a little different. We don't have, I, I don't think there's as much of a reservation presence in, uh, yeah, that's true. There is in Oklahoma. Yeah. And there might be a bit more overlap between the two states in terms of who's going in and out of it for yeah. their work and stuff like that. But, you know, I've never been to Oklahoma. I dated a woman from Texas for a long time. So I, I'm a bit jaundiced in, in my perspective. <laughs> on uh, how those two states relate to one another but you know now that i'm on the green corn rebellion i'm a i'm a sooner sooner all the way i guess i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and i also assume there's a similar rivalry between the two pairs of states as well oh yeah i don't think anyone could from new york thinks about new jersey <laughs> i would say it's mostly a relationship between long island and new jersey Oh, it's kind of like I kind of refer to that as like the Spider-Man meme where they're pointing <laughs> at each other, but they're exactly the same. They're, there's no difference between Long Island and New Jersey as far as I'm concerned. But uh, yeah, I would say it's more micro. Yeah, in that way, yeah. there's just so like upstate, upstate New York, uh, where I went to college in upstate New York, and it's completely different than like the New York City area. It might as well like it's its own thing. And there's different parts of upstate New York that are distinguished from one another. I was in central New York, like Syracuse area, not Syracuse exactly, but that's its own thing. Yeah. And then Rochester's its own thing and Buffalo's its own thing. So like those are completely different within the state itself too. And that's not even considering New York or Hudson Valley or Long Island. Like it's an incredibly diverse state and very large. But you know enough about New York and New Jersey for that matter. <laughs> yeah, enough about those states that aren't Oklahoma. But yeah, I I would mean about Oklahoma. What what should I what should I know about Oklahoma? Uh, Not the time. It's your show. You can take it any way you want. But. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to really talk about Oklahoma a lot, but um, let's see. I don't know. There's. Have you been anywhere like in the southern? region of the united states at all like have you been like yeah no my family from south carolina and like i okay. said I've, I've been to texas a bunch now okay uh, yeah so yeah I'm from was... here with okay. the larger staff yeah like but not, local... not not the midwest slash slash like yeah. plain not familiar with that at all yeah um yeah in oklahoma um let's see we have I'm trying to think of some of the sites um drawing a blank oh no uh, <laughs> if you were to say if you were to meet an alien or something like that and you had to show them one thing from oklahoma that's representative of the state what would you show them if you had like one opportunity to be like hmm. they're like why why shouldn't we you know just vaporize cool. okay this state? <laughs> um wow okay now now you've made this hard for me. i'm just raising this face is all yeah i don't know <laughs> they like, benevolent aliens as well yeah, like for me, like I like whenever, which is very rare for me, but like whenever I drive through the more eastern parts of the state, more or less the northeastern part of the state, there's a lot of, it's more rural areas and there's a lot of trees out there and it's different from like my part of the state kind mm -hmm. of. And so I get to see different types of trees that I don't necessarily see here. And there's a certain part of the northeastern part of the state that's more uh, not mountains necessarily, but more hills. Mm -hmm. And I don't I we had to drive over there once when I was a kid for something. And it was really scary. Like it was just <laughs> it, and it was like, oh, but like those are some interesting features there aren't like specific things that i could always there's always there's certain places that i would always tell people to go to like oh if you're like in the central oklahoma area you should go check out um frontier cities like the cool oh, amusement yeah. park um or um something like that like it's yeah I don't know. I feel I feel weird not coming up with a whole bunch of stuff off the top of my head because I, spr I sprung on you. I, I apologize. No, you're good because like most of the things I like about Oklahoma don't have anything to do with like specific places or just like 
in general things like i said well that's why yeah yeah that's yeah. what i'm i was that's what i was like trying to make the connection to it's like yeah, yeah the, the thing you know the culture of the state or something you like about it doesn't have to be the physical landscape yeah. there's nothing that remarkable about the physical landscape of where i'm from but you know i <laughs> i i think the people and the culture of the state is very interesting because it's the most densely populated state so yeah. you know there's things like that yeah that's that's something that i always find to be interesting because i think of a friend she uh from a different state rhode island but you could also say this about rhode island that's pretty densely populated to a certain extent but she says that she's from rural rhode island and i'm like wait what do you mean rural rhode island like what part of that small thing is rural like I could travel the distance of that state within like a day's time and still have plenty of time within the day. Like in in like certain like contexts of certain things mean different things in y'all's area. Like oh yeah. <laughs> like what is it? Like um and I noticed this whenever I like went to college and I grew up in a place where I didn't have a high like the school district I live in didn't have a high school at the time so when I graduated middle school we had to transfer to another school district to go to high school and the nearest one not nearest but like close to nearest one for me was Shawnee High School which is the one I graduated from and mm -hmm. it's still about like 25 to 30 minutes away from where I live but to yeah. me that's not that far of a drive but to right. someone who lives in a city that's like forever to them and mm -hmm. i'm just like how like that's just like a normal drive to me but like i bet for someone in new york city or lives in the area that you grew up in uh even the concept of driving at all is foreign to them <laughs> yeah because of the public transit yeah yeah i just so i'm in north carolina now and i have a car for the first time since i was in high school and like just driving to do things i hate it honestly i really don't i don't like having to take my car to get groceries like it it's like it takes like 45 minutes whereas <laughs> like before i would just walk down the street and it would it would probably take almost about the same amount of time but i was walking to do it and i was carrying everything and i was just like you know i wasn't like sitting in traffic or anything like that so there are little changes, you know, you, you, you come to enjoy other things and, you know, you, there's nice and bad, there's good and bad things about everything ultimately, but yeah, no, it is all relative, I think, to like where you, your situation and where you are and what you do. Um, you know, I remember having friends in New York who moved from, you know, other parts of the country who are like, I just drove through three states, like to go to DC or something like that. And they're like, had their minds blown and I was like yeah that's you know how geography works that's how like state lines work you know <laughs> but then I go out west and I'm you know driving through one state an entire day I'm just like having my mind blown by how big it is at west of the Mississippi basically and just like the yeah. spectral range of things you know it's just you know you, you adjust and you, and you figure it out and you take in you know how different things are in this crazy crazy country we live in yeah um so the second question i have is what got you interested in politics and what helped form your political beliefs as you got older um broadly speaking well i will say like quite i this isn't a secret by any means but like i was not particularly politically activated um when i was your age or how old are you like 22 23 I'm 23 yeah okay yeah so I was like only starting to get any understanding of like politics when I was your age like I understood things broadly in a in a, in a historical context but like my own stakes involved in politics I was not like particularly aware of mostly because of privilege and mostly because I was like in college and like just learning all the time and like in a rural setting where it was just like do work learn don't think about anything else no externalities which is how i like to learn frankly but it's maybe not like the most <laughs> productive way to be a yeah. member of society but um so i was working in the media and you know just working in like political media and stuff like that and i became more and more aware of how things worked what was going on 
And then eventually, you know, things start happening around you that begin to impact your life in some way or another. And then you have a better understanding of how things work, why they work that way. And, you know, what, what it means for people around you, yourself and the people you care about. And also like how, you know, you benefit from things that maybe uh, are harmful to other people in the zero sum nature of how politics work. Um, so yeah, that was really like, that's kind of how it started. I think working in political media just kind of like we made it, it was, there was no other way. And I was very interested in it because it was constantly going and changing. And I was really drawn to that energy and uh, you know, this sort of like, the circus of it all, honestly, like, I don't, I mean, I don't know how to put it in any, like, like it's, it shouldn't be, I don't think politics should be seen as such spectacle. I think it should be way more boring, but like for lack of, you know, it just, it's just not how it is. Yeah. Uh, so I was happy to like, you know, engage with that because I thought, I felt like it was impactful. I think when I was in college, the first job I wanted, like, I, or the, my dream job coming out of college was like, working for the Daily Show or John Stewart or something like that. And ultimately I did work on his like never happened HBO show. So like that was kind of like, I, I kind of wanted to work at that intersection of like entertainment and politics for a little while. Cause I felt like it actually, when I was your, when I was like younger than you, I guess, um, there was this sense that things like the Daily Show and Stephen Colbert like actually did something and meant something to people and like it was changing, it was moving the needle in some way. I think we've proven that that's not the case. And I think yeah. Trump's presidency is like <clears throat> his point in that demonstration. But um, there was, at that time, it felt like there was a sense that that was the case. And I, I definitely like felt that when I was like, you know, 20. I feel like if I'm gonna work in entertainment, this would be a good way, this would be a productive way to do it. I'm not just making bullshit, but uh, you know, that was kind of how I got politically activated. And then working in those spaces, I realized like how disconnected those things are from people's lived experiences and what's actually going on. And, you know, here we are, I, I suppose. Um, so that's, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't getting involved in like, you know, grassroots efforts or anything like that. I'm not gonna pretend like it was. Um, so yeah, it was through the media. Okay, yeah. Um... It's funny hearing you say that you weren't really that politically aware until you were about my age when uh, Sam said that you started the majority report when you were 12. So, yeah, you know. yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a long running bit um, that I've never I never said otherwise to. It's funny. I've, I've looked at some comments and things like that. And <laughs> people really do think I am really young, but I think I've revealed that I'm not <laughs> that young. I just, I, I pass as young looking. Yeah, uh, like I remember, I'm... I remember, uh, what was it? It's like there was a couple of years ago, there's an episode where um, I think someone said, I think it was Jamie or, or Sam said that you didn't even vote for Obama uh, <laughs> the first time or the second time. I can't remember which one it was. That I couldn't vote for Obama the first. I was old enough I was old and wait, yeah, no, I was old enough to vote for him the second time, but I was yeah. not old enough to vote for him the first time. Yeah, they so, said that <laughs> once. Yeah, they said that once on the show, and and everyone was just like, "Whoa, like that's young." <laughs> I was like, "I guess," but sure, yeah. it's still older than me. <laughs> yeah, I was I was the youngest person in the show, but I was not like I think Matt's like a year and a half older than me. Matt's not that much older than me, maybe two years older than me. I, I'm 29. Like I was born yeah. in 1991. I'm not. <laughs> I'm yeah. not as young as they say I am. But yeah, you know, I, I definitely like. I was learning about politics all throughout working and things like that. And you know, let's, let's call a spade a spade. I mean, people who listen to the majority report, like the like advanced analytics version of like uh, politics, political discourse, like yeah. most. The over 99.7% of people do not understand politics in the way that listeners in the majority report or shows like it understand politics. It's just not how the world works. And like me being out of it now for a little bit, I've come to realize just how dramatically like that rate, like that's that, uh, you know, range of like understanding of politics can be. 
even within like I'm in you know like in, in elite institution learning about policy and like even I'm like oh my god like some of these people just really don't know anything about what's going on and that's fine like it's not a value judgment on them but like you know it's I, I got to the majority report and was like wow I really need to learn some things even after Sam hired me I was like all right, I'm going to learn, <laughs> I'm going to learn about, you know, really inside baseball stuff, even stuff that like, I don't think, you know, anyone knows about other than Sam. Sam is like a, Sam is a supercomputer of political knowledge. Truly. Yeah. It's astonishing. Yeah, it is. Like he's, that's one of the things that like made me like watch the show or continue to watch the show was because like, he just seems so knowledgeable about, you know, recent political history and, well, not just recent, but like, when I say recent, I mean, like, the last, like, 10 years prior sure. to me watching the show, but also he knew a lot about, like, uh, you know, the, uh, the 90s and stuff like that. And he, I, I like, because, like, I used to watch Tom Hartman a lot when I was in high school mm -hmm. and Tom Hartman's like 70 and he knows a whole lot about, you know, history and politics of the last, like, you know, existence. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I, I liked being able to hear, you know, people who have been able to live through a lot of this stuff and have dealt with a lot of these things over the years uh, and hearing what they have to say. And yeah, like, Sam's got a lot of knowledge. Um. <laughs> Episodes of the Green Corn Rebellion show are sponsored by Oklahoma Progress Now. Oklahoma Progress Now is a 501c4 organization focused on building progressive power in Oklahoma. Their primary efforts are on developing progressive content for a 21st century audience, coalition, and capacity building across progressive organizations and causes, and working to see elected leaders who are more responsive to their constituents and the needs of the many. Areas of focus include progressive messaging and communications, coalition building and resource sharing, and focused progressive policy goals. You can check out their Twitch live streams, and they go uh, live on Facebook on at noon, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Please support this organization. It's a really great organization. It's just getting started here in Oklahoma. Uh, thank you. Now enjoy the rest of the video. Let's see. Oh, yeah. So what did you do before the majority report? Like, what jobs did you do, like, out of college right. before the majority report? Um, I was always working in, like, I worked in, like, digital media, I guess you could say um there was when i got out of college the big thing was like i don't know you might have heard this just in like in like the meme version of it or might have known about it at the time but like there was that whole like pivot to video thing where it was like every digital media startup or like digital media company was instead of writing articles they were like we're gonna make videos instead on Facebook and make a lot more money and look more valuable to investors and, you know, VC firms that are paying for us to keep the lights on here. And there are all these, like, all these digital media companies at the time that everyone had a stake in some capacity. There's Vice and Vox and Mike and uh, uh, Mashable, Adi and Fusion, where I worked, which was owned by Univision and ABC. And I think Vice might own part of it as well, or people who owned it also owned Vice. Um, but I ended up getting a job permalancing, which is a ver version of freelancing where you're working full time, but you don't get any of the benefits. Mm -hmm. um, I was working for them as a production, a PA as production assistant. So I would shoot, edit, write, film interviews and videos and segments and stuff like that and they figured rightly it was a lot cheaper to teach me how to do this stuff like not that well than to pay someone who's like union or actually good at it um 
so and they're right i ended up learning all those skills which were very valuable to my like you know career or whatever and uh so i did that and then through them i met a lot of people they ended up hiring a lot of people who worked for the daily show and stuff like that and like comedy producers in new york city to work on a number of projects there i became close with all those people and then i started getting brought on for like some pilot stuff for like True TV and then ultimately got an interview for that John Stewart thing at HBO and I worked there for a year before that shut down. A lot of those people are working on his a, his Apple show now, which is cool. Happy for them. And then after that ended, I moved back. That was on the shore in Jersey actually, because John lives out there with his family. Um, he's like a couple houses in New Jersey. And I was happy to go. I was like, oh, this would be great to live on the beach. And that was fun. And then I moved back to the city. I was looking all over for jobs. I was finding like some inconsistent work that summer, but I needed like full-time job. And like, I was lucky to always have a full-time job. A lot of people I knew who were doing what I did did not. And I think that made me more resilient than me. I was always just very anxious about not having that work. Um, I applied to like, a, honestly, it must've been like 500 jobs just every day I would wake up and treat it. I would treat my unemployment like a job. And I was very lucky because New Jersey had an incredible unemployment program where I was getting paid like almost as much as I was making for HBO. Um, and I was not in like any uh, like trouble for it to run out. I also got like a severance package through HBO, which was really nice. Um, so I was fine. It was just the anxiety of not working and not having a job and just spending money and not much coming in, even though it was. And uh, eventually um, I applied to this job on ZipRecruiter, as everyone knows at this point, <laughs> um, through the ad reads. I had no idea what it was other than like, it had a, a very like detailed, like uh, sort of like job application that was not like, it, it, it seemed like more personal than like, other ones I was like these are weird questions why am I being asked like what radio programs I listen to what do, and why do I believe in the radio as like a concept I was like this is strange <laughs> but I had some like answers I, I actually was like I actually can answer this quite well and um I mentioned in those questions I mentioned um coast to coast with Greg Norrie which is this show that I was getting into at the time because I was unemployed and didn't, you know, what I didn't know what I was doing. And it's this show, Greg Nori Coast to Coast, it's been on forever. And it's this guy out in Orange County now, I think, California. And he's like the original Alex Jones, but he's way more like benevolent and funny and like interesting. He's like way more believing than Alex Jones. Yeah. He's not as like he's not as like conspiratorial, even though he's dealing purely in conspiracy. But like he talks about like you know, the ancient aliens and like the pyramids and like people being visited and things like that. And he just takes calls and people tell them stories about how they were abducted and stuff like that. And like different like Mayan rituals and things like that. And he's just like, it's, it's crazy. He's like master at it, but like it's really strange stuff. And then I also said, I really love WFMU, which is this radio station in Jersey city, the very famous independent radio station that was like huge, 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 huge in the nineties as like alt alternative culture, I guess. And uh, it's still really great. I listen to it. There's an app for it, a standalone app for the radio station. It's still broadcast over the air, but if you live elsewhere in the country, you can listen to it anytime. They archive all their shows as podcasts. Um, it's wonderful. And you can learn all about wonderful kinds of music, things you would never hear elsewhere and really thoughtful DJs. Um, a lot of like musicians also DJ there and have shows like weekly shows and it's all run on like, you know, community basis. And I was always very drawn to that. So I put down those two things and then I get an email back from like this, whoever posted this and it's Sam, not that I, I, and I didn't know it was Sam at the time, I don't think. And, um, he has me come in and we sit in like, the studio is set up so that there's like the studio and then there's like a back studio that no one goes to like ever basically but he brought me in there and I was like wearing like you know 
a nice shirt and pants and you know sam was wearing like what he always wears um and he just sat down and it was the end of the show or after the end of the show and he was you know it, we we're all we're always like a little behind the scenes like we're always kind of gassed at the end of the show it's hard to do three hours of radio i don't know how sam does it every day it's it's a lot of work to just be on air for that long um and i sit down and i'm so eager to like have a, an interview after for, after so long and he just like looks over my resume and he's like so when I was working with Busey, I worked on a show with Busey out in uh, California <laughs> and we would shoot days on end. And when I was living in this apartment in Santa Monica or whatever, uh, you know, bed on the floor and I would listen to Coast to Coast with George Nori. There are bugs all over the apartment. And I thought I was losing my mind when I did that. I was like, dude, I, I hear what you're saying. Completely like not, a, it didn't feel like a real interview. I thought he just wanted to talk to me. And then he was like, yeah, and you know, you know, the majority report, the first episode we ever recorded was out of WFMU in Jersey City. And I was like, no way, that's awesome. He's like, yeah, Benjamin and I went out there or something like that. And uh, yeah, I think Sharpling, it was right after Sharpling's show, Tom Sharpling of The Best Show used to do his show out of WFMU. Um, and like, then Sam asked me like what I did previously. And I said like, I had to block like, I, at my last job at uh, with John Stewart, my job, I was like the research producer. So I had to find all the footage in addition to like finding the stories that we wanted to talk about. I was basically like the news guy in like feeding things to comedy writers. And whenever I was looking for stuff that was like non-licensed, I would just use YouTube. And every time I tried to find a clip, it would just be like the majority report at the top. And it would just be Sam talking straight to camera with like a second of the clip I'm actually looking for when I'm actually looking for like the raw footage. And I told Sam, I was like, dude, I had to block you guys on YouTube because uh, I was looking for all this stuff that you guys were like not really showing. You're just playing like clipping as a video. And, and that was pretty much the end of the interview. And then Sam sent me like some writing assignment that it was like unclear of what I was supposed to do. But I did it and he asked me to come in like the next Monday and you know, the rest, the rest is history as they say. So that's my story of how I, before and got leading up to the majority report. So you so. ended the job interview by saying you blocked the show on yeah. YouTube. <laughs> Honestly, I would just recommend that to people as like a bit of advice. If you're, if you're ever like, if you're ever like uh, need to be familiar with the product that you're working with, just say that you've consumed it so much or you know so much about it that you can't even look at it anymore. <laughs> I don't know if that works with everyone, but it works with people like Sam and you know such people. So that's funny. That's cool. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so could you tell me a little bit about your time on the Majority Report? Um, Within reason, yeah. yeah. What do you want to like? What it? It was a it was a wonderful experience. Um, what were some of your like favorite moments? Oh man, I would have to like sit down and honestly like think about that. There's I, something I do that something something I've noticed about myself that is not one of my favorite parts about myself is that I have all these amazing experiences and I never write them down and I just end up forgetting them. And then they like randomly like flash back to me and I'm like, wow, that was so cool. Like. That's so cool that that happened and then you're like shit like i should be i should have been chronicling this the entire time but that's just not like how i operate um but i would say generally just the especially i think this is true probably of most jobs but i can only speak to my professional experience in the media um there's a there's a certain sort of like this is overused but like a kafka-esque uh like state of like existence in the media where you end up making something working really hard on it and then it just kind of gets thrown into the void and you're like i just like you know broke my back over this thing and you know was really stressed out about it and I put in all this work and like it just got delivered to some hub and i don't know if anyone's ever going to see this thing like i may not ever even see this thing unless i seek it out um and you're in this huge organization there's so many people doing so many different things and you're just working through this labyrinth all the time where you're just like what am i what is going on here i don't even know 
And then there's like, you, you get this look from the inside and you're just like, oh, strange. Um, whereas like with the majority report, it was literally like five people that, you know, made this thing happen. And there's like, there's like a lot of responsibility with that. And I, I thrived on that. I was like, it's, it's just us. We're the only ones who can do this and we have to do it. Like, that's the only way it's going to happen. And not only that, like there are people waiting on this and people who really, you know, spend their free time with this. And Matt said something a long time ago, or he said it a few times, but I don't exactly remember when, but he basically said like, you know, he, he takes the responsibility of using people's free time very seriously. And I thought that was an incredibly insightful thing to remark on because yeah, it's like, it's an incredible, like, responsibility to be the steward of someone's free time if they so choose to spend it with you like that's not that's not nothing yeah um and there'd be days where you're like man i don't want to I, I like who cares about like you know like i don't know some primary in some district that like no one cares about that like is like it's like where like the progressive got crushed or something like that like why do we need to talk about this but like Ultimately, like someone else is going to listen to that show and it's going to be very impactful to them or important to them, or maybe they just need it that day. They don't want to think about something else. And like that sort of that reminder made it really pleasant to work on the show and also like gave it a lot of uh, meaning to me because um, I, 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 at least to this point in my life, maybe that'll change. I hope it does it's been hard for me to do work where I don't see the like meaning in it or like that just kind of feels rote at times. Mm -hmm. um, so the, I would say broadly speaking, that's, um, that's what I liked about the show working on it. Um, more specifically, <laughs> um, there's like, Sam should have had, I'm surprised Sam didn't have me sign an NDA, but like there are certain things <laughs> I'm not at liberty to speak about. Um, at all um, but you know the relationship I developed with Sam was very special and uh, you know I, I I'm very grateful for it it's 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 a weird thing to realize you spend more time with this this coworker, this boss of yours than you do with like your own family basically um, way more not even close is the thing that's that's where it gets a little strange but you know Sam and I you know it's it's a good relationship and you know i'm very grateful for everything he's offered me and taught me over the years like i've learned i learned a whole lot and i think i taught sam some stuff too um i can't take all the credit but i think i was definitely an influential part in sam's uh rediscovery or budding interest in the reconstruction era while i was there i do take i will take a little bit of credit for uh, that development um, I think I'm trying to think like specifically, there's just like a number of days where, um, you know, Sam would come up with some hatch, some idea that we would all like, kind of like feverishly try to get to like put together before noon, which was always fun, sometimes a little stressful, but mostly fun. And, you know, obviously like those were even better when like, Michael was involved and engaged before his passing. Um, like when those two would get at it and Michael would really like run with the ball, that was always really fun too. So, you know, those were really good times. Um, and, you know, the show changes all the time, but like, I, I, I do, I do think like the, uh, the like early Trump era was definitely like a high watermark for, um, the majority report as like product, I think. And I think that'll be the case until, you know, Sam decides he doesn't want to do it anymore, which I don't think will happen for a very long time. <laughs> but those are my highlights of the show, I would say, broadly speaking. Yeah, so so uh, Sam taught you that uh, social security is not gonna <laughs> run out whenever you retire. And then you told him, you taught him that the re that reconstruction is very important. Okay. I didn't teach him anything. I, did, I, just, I was just like, hey, Matt's friend told me about this uh, lecture series on uh, on Reconstruction and the Civil War, and I thought it was pretty sick. Yeah, and like... Left, he, and then he came in on Monday. I was like, I listened to all that this weekend. And I was like, wow, I haven't even finished it. Yeah. But yeah, like, it's... Um, the Reconstruction stuff, like, I mean, I'll say this. When it comes to that 
it's not that I've like never thought that it wasn't important or that it goes under discussed. I do like for me, I'm a history major. I'm going to school to become a history teacher. Oh, but, nice. Like, I was a history so, major. Yeah. Yeah. So like <clears throat> for me, I have an issue with the way I guess it's multi two or three things, but like the way that we teach history, and I think it's this way pretty much across the country. I know it's this way for me in Oklahoma. In eighth grade, you learn uh, American history from like the beginning, which the beginning is basically uh, like when like Jamestown yeah. and all that stuff and up until the Civil War. And so you learn all that. And then your junior year of high school, you learn reconstruction on to the present and for 1877 to the present whatever it sometimes yeah. they list it differently but either way so like the way that like in most people who i've talked to say this too that like they the way that they break that up is very very strange uh because it's like well the first class is like well, most of it isn't really american history it's like just colonization from europe and then you know re revolutionary wars like the fourth chapter or something you know mm -hmm. uh and then the second half post reconstruction onward is like that's like a huge chunk of act like American history that like they'll give you a year to learn it. They give the teachers a year to teach it, and then they don't end up really actually getting to teach all of it. Like yeah, most like most people I talk to, they say like, oh, like we learned a lot about World War II, but like after that, we didn't really learn about much of anything else. We kind of skim through it so we could take the state test and it's like right. yeah, that's how i remember it too and i feel like the stuff after world war ii and i have issues with the way that world war ii is taught as well but after the stuff after world war ii i feel like is like super important and i feel like it's probably going to be way more interesting to students uh because it has more of a stronger connection to what's happening today as opposed to you know stuff that happened almost 100 years ago you know and on some level i feel like that's done on purpose so people don't actually make any kind of connections to you know the civil rights movement of the 60s and then the black lives matter movement of today sure. and you know like all that good stuff but then when i hear like i remember some students the other day they asked me why i wanted to be a history teacher and I started telling them about how, like, oh, well, I just think that, you know, I feel like there needs to be a better job done at making sure students actually learn something about the country they've lived in their entire lives. Because it's kind of embarrassing to me when I meet adults who don't know anything uh, about yeah. American history. And it's like, but, but you live here. How did you not pick up on anything? I, and I started talking to them about stuff and they didn't know anything like uh i was once in a class of kids that didn't know who ronald reagan was yeah they said they'd heard of him and i was like how like that, that was a president like but anyway yeah. i digress oh um, no we need more <laughs> teachers we need more people like you getting into you know taking this stuff seriously and being those yeah. teachers like that's the yeah. only way it changes honestly and yeah. also i mean there's there's plenty of resistance to change to changing that but you know yeah and for me it's not it's not so much that like i have the issue with like the teachers themselves or anything like that because like i had good teachers um you know it's not like i'm like shitting on the teachers just to say no, yeah because I, really no, yeah. I really do think it's like the way that they expect that because i know that most teachers probably have the same critique that i'm saying like they mm -hmm. don't it's not so much that like the teachers themselves aren't able to like teach it properly or teach it. it's like we're not really setting up the teachers to be able to do that because right. of the way that we set it up but yeah but anyway 
Next question. I think everyone should have to take like, should yeah. have to like minor in history in college because like, like yeah, I just I I think of myself and like if I didn't know what I know, like even you know I have a degree in history, which is like a funny thing to actually reckon with. <laughs> And I still don't know that much. And I'm perfectly aware of that. But like, I think you're only aware of that once you start to like, you know, just scratch the surface a little bit. You're like, oh yeah. boy, there's a lot more here than I realized. Yeah. Uh, and I think there are a bunch of people who don't even recognize, have that realization. And they just, you know, they go on in life and they're mostly happy and they're fine and they don't care. And then people like you and I come along and they're, they're like, I'm fine. Don't, you don't have to worry about me. I'm I don't need to know who Ronald Reagan is. I'm, I have a mortgage and stuff like that, which like, I don't right. regret that. But like, it's when people get, it's when people get taken for a ride by people whose motives are not entirely uh, uh, salient or uh, honest. Yeah. Uh, taking them to like, for their own political motives and preying on their uh, emotional, you know, sort of feelings and things like that. Yeah. Um. Let's see. So what are you doing currently? I am in the health policy program at UNC Billings. So I'm learning all about health policy and really trying to shore up my quantitative analysis abilities because that was one thing. That was another goal of mine getting out of, uh, out of undergrad was uh, I don't want to ever have to run an Excel sheet in my work. <laughs> and I was very successful at that, but it turns out a lot of jobs, most jobs, you need those skills. And I want to learn those skills so that I can you know, have that in my repertoire moving forward. Um, but yeah, no, one of the things I feel like working as Sam's producer, I got to be like a bit of a dilettante on all aspects of American policy and making the assessment of like what I felt, what I was most interested in what I felt most passionate about and what I felt was a good use of my energy and where I felt like change could be made in a like practical and realistic way was on health policy and how we uh, structure and run healthcare in this country and I do feel like despite all my cynicism and like just like really uh, like down attitude towards where our our politics lie right now especially given like, you know, the, the human infrastructure uh, bill as it stands at this point in time. Um, I do think health policy is just this thing that it's coming and it's going to change one way or another. And we need smart people uh, working in that space in all sectors and aspects of it, you know, improve these outcomes and uh, policy and healthcare for people. Like it's just un it's untenable at this point in time and it needs to get better. Um, so I felt like I felt like I had done everything I wanted to do in the media, frankly. Um, looking forward, forecasting what my life was gonna look like. I was not excited by that. And um, I felt like this was the change I wanted to make. So I, in graduate school in North Carolina, to the short of it. All right. That's and I'm enjoying <laughs> That's good. I never thought I would go back to school. Never thought. And it is a little silly at times, but it's it's largely nice, I have to say. If anyone's ever contemplating graduate school, I'm happy to uh, give them my two cents on the matter. So let me know. Okay. Um, and the last question I have here is what kind of music do you listen to? I listen to all kinds of music. I know you're a metalhead, um, <laughs> a new metalhead specifically. Yes. Um, that is not my cup of tea, I would say. I do appreciate it. Someone, this musician I follow, this guy, Riley Walker, who's amazing on Twitter, by the way. Everyone should follow him on Twitter. He's hilarious. He's from like Illinois. He's from like Rockford, Illinois or something like that. And he plays like very like, he's kind of all over the place. He's just like a guitar virtuoso, but he's very funny. And he posted the original like like demos, I guess, of Slipknot. And I listened to some of it from like 1996 Six, or something yeah. like that. And it was awesome. I was like, whoa, this is really cool. I think before they got really like thrashy and like overproduced, the raw stuff was like, I was like, oh, I'm down with this. It's pretty cool. Very like proggy almost. Yeah. Um, I listened to it in my time. 
I listen to so much, man. I listen to a lot of stuff. Um, but like, I think if someone were to just pin me to something, um, you know, I love the Grateful Dead. I'm a big fan of the Grateful Dead. A lot of people do not are surprised when they learn that, but that's fine. I don't listen to other jam bands, really. I really only listen to like the Dead and like those associated acts. Um, I've been listening to a lot of uh, ambient music lately, mm -hmm. which is a lot of fun, um, especially with like studying and stuff like that. But I do a lot of like, I've been listening to like a lot of like, like lost 80s ambient new age stuff, just randomly like finding it and stuff like that. A big shout out to um, Avant Ghetto, uh, Jeff Conklin on Twitter as well. He was an old, uh, not old, but like he had been a DJ at WFMU for a long time. He's also a listener to the Majority Report. Um, but he he is a great guide in that field. He's also loves a lot of great music that I'm always excited to listen to. Um, but to really answer your question, not beat around the bush anymore, um, I would say when I was your age and in college, um, I got really into My Morning Jacket, which is a band from Louisville, Kentucky. They have a new album coming out tomorrow, October 22nd which is their self-titled, their first album in six years. They're like, they're very interesting. They're like, they're not quite a Southern rock band. They're not quite a jam band. They're not quite an indie band. They're kind of like this like amorphous thing that like keeps getting shaped around the main dude, Jim James, his like sort of vision and his voice. He has this incredible singing voice. They used to, rec they recorded their first three albums in, the other, his cousin, who was the guitar player in the original form of the band, and his grandparents' uh, grain silo. So they have this crazy re reverb, natural reverb, that they recorded the tape. And it's just like this ethereal, crazy singing that I just like, I remember seeing live for the first time in Massachusetts when I was like 19 and just had my head blown off my shoulders. I was just like so taken away. And um yeah so I really love them and then they're just like you know I love all the like oh yeah I would say like a definitionally a good definition uh sort of like music I love is if you go to Aquarium Drunkard it's a website it's an old like music blog basically that's still around um aquariumdrunkard.com I basically love everything they put on there no that's run by this guy Justin Gage and oh man another guy jason i'm forgetting his last name i follow him on twitter he's great too um and andy kush um i think he's involved but like all the stuff they post on aquarium drunkard is great he has a show justin gage from aquarium drunkard has a show on xm on sirius xmu every wednesday for two hours and they play all kinds of like cool stuff it's a lot of like it's just like this style of rock music that's like very open and like interpretive and like fun basically like they'll play stuff from brazil they'll play stuff from japan but it all has like a certain like sort of like vibe to it that i really dig that's very like kind of like uninhibited i like artists that just do their thing like i will always like i've never been one that's been disappointed in a band's direction like maybe i don't like it personally i don't vibe with it but if someone is just going out there and doing their thing, I think that's the most, that's all I could add. That's, those are my favorite artists basically is like, yeah, they're just doing their thing and they're just following it because I think that's an incredibly powerful thing to do in 21st century America is just follow your muse and do your thing because so many of us, myself included, are just afraid. Like it's, it's hard to like go out and like just do what you want to do. Like you running for office, man, that's a good example of that. Like just going out and like, like being, having conviction in your actions and like your decisions, like people who can follow that. I'm just like, I, I support those people 110%, especially artists, because that's an incredibly like vulnerable way to express yourself. Um, it's also why I love Lou Reed. Lou Reed's another one I'll put in there. I think Lou Reed is honestly one of the coolest people of the 20th, in 20th century America. He was such a weirdo, <laughs> but also like a tough guy too. Very strange guy definitely one of the top five New Yorkers of his generation. Like Velvet Underground, everyone's talking about that documentary that came out. It seems very cool. I don't have an Apple TV subscription and I love Todd Haynes. So I will watch it eventually, but 
Lou Reed after the Velvet Underground to me is as interesting, if not more so, than he was in the Velvet Underground. He did all kinds of weird stuff. He did that with Metallica. I don't know yeah. if you knew that. Oh, I know. Yeah. That, yeah. That's you know how I know that, who yeah. he is. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. He's, I love Lou Reed. He's so cool. Um, but yeah, I would say that my morning jacket and Lou Reed, I, I put them right at the top of uh, the Brendan band pyramid. And when I was younger, when I was in like middle school and high school, I was obsessed with the band, which is, uh, they played with Bob Dylan and they had a movie that Martin Scorsese directed of their last concert called The Last Waltz. And they were kind of, they were like, they were really weird too. But like in like a, like they were friends with all the hippies and everything in the psychedelic era. But like, they were like, we're, we we're interested in like, you know, like, like, I don't know, the civil war and stuff like that. Like they wore suits and stuff like that during it. And I was like, these guys are strange. And their drummer was the main singer, Levon Helm. Um, and they they were incredible. Um, I still love them, but I don't really listen to them as much as I used to, just because they're a little bit like, all right now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's I would put those, those are my favorites. My Morning Jacket, Grateful Dead, all the Jerry Garcia projects, Lou Reed, specifically when Lou Reed was playing with Robert Quine. Those are incredible albums. Um, and and then uh, the band. So, yeah. All right. And all the stuff that surrounds that stuff. It's a wide range. I don't want to limit it, but I do want to give some names. I want to name names here. <laughs> I appreciate that question, too. That's one I was looking forward to. Not that I wasn't looking forward to other ones. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, thank you so much for coming on um it means a lot to get to have you on my show um after watching you on the majority report you are yes the second person from the majority report no no no, no. third because all matt right bender, because matt bender has come on too so you're the third nice. person from the majority report to come on uh michael i believe was first yes, oh wow because he came on in april of last year so yeah wow yeah. that's amazing that's really special i'm sure that was a wonderful conversation it was it really was awesome. um but yeah so you're the third person from majority report i mean if you want to include brandon he was on last oh, yeah. year Definitely include Bef brandon. yeah it, if, if you include him then you're the fourth so wow yeah. you're, you're, <laughs> you're scraping the bottom of the barrel now <laughs> because he, he came on before he was like on the majority report every week when he was so, just the discourse, Brandon. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it was like a little over a year ago. Not you almost have your uh, your Thanos glove of a uh, majority, yeah, right? Yes. Yeah, I want to get wanted, Jamie and Matt. Yeah, I I want to get Jamie on. She follows me on Twitter, uh, and so does Matt. Matt does too. Mm -hmm. I want to try to get Matt on because I got David Griscom on from Left Right. Oh, nice. I had him on a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah. Greg, you got the right idea, man. You just ask people and people will do things for you. I This is a lesson I still have not learned and I'm almost 30. Like I, I still am like completely intimidated to ask people to, to do things with me or something. And it's like, just ask, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah, just gonna answer. I really yeah. want to get Sam on sometime too because he's interested. Sam's a little more busy than the rest of us. He is. Yeah, still. he is. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like... I'll, I'll get them all one day. I'll be able yeah. to have multiple gloves, I guess. In that instance, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but thank you, man. Where can we find you on social media? I believe my Twitter is BF1IN. It's BFIN with a one. And uh, it's a photo of AJ Soprano in a New Jersey Devils hat is the mm -hmm. avatar. And uh, background is Neil Young, a Neil Young cover. From American Stars and Bars. Um, yeah, follow me there. I'm definitely losing followers since I left the majority report, but I feel like I'm flipping back into the cool zone of number of followers and on Twitter, and the real heads are sticking around, which I appreciate. So, you know, it's yeah. good, all good. Uh, but, Greg, thank you so much for having me on the program and letting me, you know, talk and chat. I, I don't, I'm, almost positive not say anything incriminating or particularly embarrassing but maybe i'll listen back and uh you know i am a subscriber so that won't All be right. too hard and uh, good luck with your campaign launch on sunday
Thank you. And thank you for uh, donating to the campaign. I think you donated whenever I called in the first time, like two or three. Yeah, months Matt ago. shared it and I saw it and I was like, oh yeah, of course. Got to Dude, no, I mean, it's, it's a very bold thing that you're doing. And, you know, if, if all I have to do is send, you know, the money I would otherwise, you know, drink one night, like, absolutely, easy. And Not just, be a question. just because you, you said money that you would drink one night, he donated a thousand dollars. He's an alcoholic. And <laughs> help. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It wasn't a thousand dollars, but no, thank That's you. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get bottle way. service all the time here <laughs> in uh, <North> Carolina. <laughs> I'll That's what those student you. loans are going towards. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Hey, take care, Greg. Good luck with everything this weekend. Have a good one. <laughs>